the kind of uh, programming that we've been doing recently, and then I'll talk about some favorite collections. And Rona, please jump in at any moment with your um, with your thoughts and your and your feelings about these things too. So uh, well, hopefully with um, audio that people can can hear. <laughs> You're coming clear to me now. Excellent. Um, so many of you may have received handouts at the beginning of the day that shared a little bit more about uh, donating materials to the archives and accessing and doing research in the archives. Um, I thought I could frame a little bit more broadly what are archives even, um, although many of you may be familiar with this, having worked with archives or being archivists yourselves. Um, so simply put, archives are just materials that everyone creates in the conduct of their daily life that have been preserved because of some quote unquote enduring historical value. Um, another definition that I've heard that I like is that they're unique constellations. So as opposed to uh, books or um, movies that you could check out from any library around the country, um, archives may not all be unique materials, but as collections, they form unique constellations of materials that can't be accessed anywhere else. Um, and of course, digital archives trouble that a little bit. Um, and another definition that I sometimes uh, look to is that they're one form of memory work. So institutional archives, as we think about them in the US, is not the only way that history is recorded. They're not the only primary sources um, that people have. So family archives, community archives, um, personal scholarly archives, these are all part of the fabric of the primary sources that we look to when building histories. So what are the Barnard Archives and Special Collections? We have a few emphases um, at the Barnard Archives. Um, we collect materials primarily that document Barnard um, College and its history, so its academic life, um, from students to alums to the administration, staff, and faculty. We also collect what are called special collections. So these materials might not relate directly to the history of Barnard, but they fall within our uh, areas of emphasis, which are very broad, uh, histories of feminism and histories of dance. So within that, we have a few specific niches of collecting, but those are broad collecting areas. Um, we provide these source materials to both the Barnard community and researchers from around the world, um, activists, artists, documentarians, all sorts of users come and use the Barnard archives. And I think importantly, um, our, our work is informed by reparative frameworks to actively confront histories of exclusion of people with marginalized, with marginalized identities within our collections and uh, also from the college as a whole. So trying to repair that work and trying to hold up histories of people who have been marginalized both in the past and in the present. So our collections include paper and analog AV materials and digital materials. And I include this GIF, I hope it's not too nausea inducing, of the Barnard Archives stacks, which are on the lower level of the New Milstein Center um, in temperature and humidity controlled uh, closed setting. So because the materials are unique, they're not able to be browsed like library materials. You can request to use um, records, um, and this is detailed more in the uh, brochure that was sent around in the beginning of the day, how to access archival materials. So I included this screenshot of the old Barnard website. Um, I think it's from the early 2000s, but I'm not sure. Um, the, that indicates that we also do collect um, digital materials. So it's a little bit less of a um, picture to be able to show because these are stored on servers, you know, around the campus and around the world, but we collect websites, we collect emails, we collect digital photos, um, and those form probably the largest part of our collection moving forward. Um, so as I mentioned, we support researchers in our beautiful reading room, um, and we also work with remote researchers around the world right now because of COVID. All of our work is remote. We're, we're trying to answer as many questions virtually, relying on our digital collections, those are also outlined in the brochure, but um, we have a very small subset of our collections that have been digitized that are available online, but they probably represent under 1% of our total collections. I also do teaching primary source instruction in the reading room as well. Um, students uh, are a huge part of the work in the archives, both as employees of the archives, student associates, um, as well as um, researchers. and. There have been some amazing student research projects that have um, come out in the past, actually just few months to a year. 
Um, so I saw that Monica Mercado is here. Um, this uh, product, our project on the right was inspired some work um, that Monica did um, at Bryn Mawr um, and it was led by Corinne Jackson um, from the class of 2020, um, a project called Black at Barnard, which um, sought to uncover histories and data about um, the lives of black students on Barnard's campus. And then at the right, there's a project called Rooming at Barnard, which is just this phenomenal project that began as my Garfinkel, um, who's from the class of 2019, began as a senior thesis and then evolved over, over the course of the next year. Um, and this project investigates um, dorms and uh, living situations on Barnard's campus and off of Barnard's campus and kind of the conception of the campus within the middle of New York City. So we really like to champion the work of students to build these histories and lead research projects. We also broaden access to our collections through exhibits and programming. So on the right is an image of an exhibit that we did last year with BOSS, or I should say BOSS did it with our support. Um, the Barn Organization, Organization of Soul Sisters um, celebrated their 50th anniversary last year in, in 2019 and built an exhibit examining the 10 demands that were made of Barnard administration um, and looking at the history of BOSS. And um, it was a wonderful, wonderful gathering for the, for the college. Um, at the top right, some of you, if you happen to be on campus during reunion last year, might have seen Sherry Suttles from the class of 1969 um, talking about her archives and her collection at Barnard. I'll talk a little bit more about that collection a bit later. And then at the bottom right, we did uh, a major digitization project um, funded by a grant to um, make a lot of audio cassettes. So over 300 audio cassettes from the Scholar and Feminist Conference, which the Barnard Center for Research on Women, or formerly the Women's Center, has been holding on Barnard's campus since 1974. So actually last year, they create an entire conference. Their, their annual conference was around archives. So we set up a really meta listening booth where you could hear about archives, listen to archives, engage with archives, and, and think about histories of um, ECRW and of the conference. And many of those tapes are available online now through our digital collections. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we also teach primary source literacy um, and archival research methodologies really across the curriculum. So in addition to history classes, we work with urban studies, um, political science, women's gender sexuality studies, Africana studies, and, and many more across the curriculum. And we think about ways to embed this work, not just with Barnard's archives, but archival thinking in a lot of, um, a lot of the curriculum. And I think Probably most importantly for today, um, I see our role in the archives as building connections between the past and the present and future of Barnard, especially through sharing the histories of alums. So we have been engaged, um, as one example of this, we've been engaged in a year and a half long project celebrating the life and legacy of Ansake Shange, who, as many of you may know, is from the class of 1970. And we'll plug, there, there'll be a programming tomorrow morning about this as well. We'll plug that at the end too. Yes, registration um, is still open, so yes. <laughs> it's saying. Um, so when Endosaki passed away, um, we held a small memorial service because we had her collection and she had really touched the lives of so many students um, on campus and over many generations of students had been so engaged um, with inquiry at Barnard. And her loss was really deeply felt. So we had a small memorial service, but then we wanted to really engage her history um, more significantly throughout a year. So we've had programming, including at the right was um, a program in the new movement lab on the lower level of, of the Milstein Center. So it's an immersive um, installation of Endosaki's video and images and archival materials. And it really felt, um, it really felt like a, a comforting and, and wonderful environment to be in, um, just to sit and to, to be surrounded by her. Um, by her magic and her genius. So I think about a lot of the work as we, that we do um, as being concerned with making these connections. And I'm really glad to work at a place that has such amazing alums because it makes my life so exciting um, to learn every day about another Barnard alum who has done wonderful things. Um, so I'll just share 
a few of the materials that I would normally be bringing out for an open house during reunion. I would love for you all to be able to touch and smell um, and hold these things. But um, unfortunately, we're doing this over Zoom. So I've tried to include some images from um, student materials and alum materials in the archives. Um, so these are some of Rona's favorites. So maybe I could let yeah, you talk about it. This is something that this uh, actually this particular scrapbook is one that I used both in my undergraduate uh, senior thesis for history as well as actually my master's thesis uh, at NYU. And Stella Block Hanau actually uh, is in, and that's 1911, obviously. Um, <laughs> and uh, she herself was such an amazing woman. She did uh, she worked with Margaret Sanger in the early uh, incarnation of Planned Parenthood. She uh, was a suffragist. She uh, um, wrote a history of the Provincetown Theater and just an incredible, incredible person. And her diary really details, um, actually in her case, the life of a Jewish student at, uh, at Barnard at the time, which uh, was not always the easiest thing to be doing. So uh, this kind of stuff, this is in, in a way what I was, well, I don't know if you heard it, but what I was trying to say about the kinds of seeing the perspective of Barnard through the eyes of a student who lived it, uh, rather than just the uh, administrative side of the college's history. Definitely, Rona. Um, thank you. So we were able to digitize Stella's diaries and scrapbooks, as well as a number of other scrapbooks. Um, a few years ago, in a collaborative NEH grant um, that we got with the other former and current seven siblings colleges. So it was about bringing together this early history of the colleges. Um, and if you've ever wondered what it's like to look at a scrapbook online, we have answered that question somewhat. Um, it is an interesting kind of challenge to deal with a, a book that opens up into two pages and then you open up a, a envelope that's glued to one of them and then five pages pop out um, and there's pressed flowers and there's all sorts of stuff. So it's an interesting kind of analog um, challenge to translate into a digital realm. Um, these are some other collections that I love to bring out. Um, on the left are the Van Bach Tuyet, um, class of 1961 notebooks. Um, so Van Bach Tuyet um, was a student at Barnard in the late 50s, early 60s, um, who majored in government. Um, she was from Saigon, um, and she entrusted these notebooks with her roommate um, right before she actually kind of abruptly left Barnard. Um, and that her roommate lost touch with her, but um, donated these um, notebooks to the archives that document, um, especially I think the perspective of a Vietnamese student who was studying um, American history, you know, during the advent and the ramp up to the Vietnam War is really um, a fascinating history. On the right um, is just a double page spread from the beautiful Alessandra Camini 56 Diaries, um, Alessandra Camini is an art historian and um, just writes beautifully um, to her family and draws these beautiful scenes in her notebooks. A few more collections. Um, as I mentioned, we did an event with Sherry Suttles last year at Reunion. Sherry's archives document um, her experience as a black student on campus in the late 1960s as one of the co-founders of BOSS and as a, an active organizer in multiple other, both Columbia and external to Columbia organizations. Um, her personal life, so she included both the letters that she sent to her mother and the letters that her mother sent to her um, and the letters that she received from friends of hers who were at many different colleges around the country. Um, so it's an amazing record of, um, her life and her activism. And after she spoke at reunion, she donated more materials from her career as city manager. Um, and she's a prolific archivist and a really wonderful colleague, wonderful friend. Um, at right is um, just the first page from the Barnard Organization of Soul Sisters records um, uh, or of their demands, the initial 10 demands that they made to the administration in, in the spring of 1969. Um, so the BOSS records include um, both these organizational materials, but also um, 
uh, photographs and speeches and clippings. Um, and they go up to the present day. So we've started collecting bosses, um, websites and social media accounts as well with their permission. And the, the students who are in BOSS, I think are uniquely attuned to the importance of their club's history. And they have a club historian who works with archives um, every year um, to build that awareness in their club. And of course, I would urge you all to come and visit and um, get to engage with Ntosaki Shange's papers. Um, they're truly an amazing collection. Um, it's a really generous donation of her personal as well as creative professional life. So Ntozaki Shange um, was an American poet um, who, as I mentioned, passed away in, in late 2018. Um, poet doesn't really do it justice. She was an educator. She was a writer. She was a dancer, a choreographer. Um, and uh, you may be familiar with her um, most famous work, which is for color girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is a neff. And on the left is um, a handwritten manuscript of Dark Phrases of Womanhood, which is the, um, the first poem in that sequence um, for color girls. So her collection includes some of her work that she created at Barnard through her adult life. Um, yeah, it's really just a, a fantastic collection. And um, some more recent materials from the archives. Um, we will talk a little bit about this more, Rona, but on the, on the left is a small portion from the Rona Wilf 1991 <laughs> papers. That's from um, a year from my, uh, my dorm room door. For those of you who are younger, we didn't just text to leave messages for people. Uh, you actually had to write them down. <laughs> I love that Rona, especially, we'll talk about this more, but as a historian thinks about the records that are really fascinating um, to people who are thinking about what student life was like in 1991. So yeah, we've had many conversations about the role in phones and all the other ways that you communicate. Um, and on the right are, is one of the letters that was donated by students. Um, in, this was a collaboration with the Office of Student Life who set up a table in the Diana Center during National Coming Out Day in 2016 and collected um, letters from students to themselves um, talking, yeah, talking about um, their coming out experience and the student life, um, the students who work in student life really made an effort to encourage people to donate materials to the archives to, to document that experience. So those are just some of the materials that I would love to show you all in person and love to share with you all. And some of them are online and you can access them through the digital collections. As I mentioned, there were those two brochures um, a day at the in the Day at the Archives download earlier in the day. Um, and you can always visit our websites, our digital collections, and our finding aids, which are three separate URLs, but all kind of similar, um, and get in touch with us either at my, my email address, which is at the start, or just archives at barn.edu. They both go to me. So I'll start sharing my screen. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, and just to let you know, the digital collections include uh, the complete run of the Barnard Bulletin, uh, all the mortarboards, um, the alumni records are, uh, not records, but the, the alumni magazine is there, uh, as well as, as Martha mentioned, things like the, uh, the scrapbooks, or at least some of them, not all of them, but some of them, uh, Stella Block's diary, that sort, of, that sort of stuff. And I know there's a question in the, in the Q&A about when will the rest of the, the archives be digitized? And I suspect the answer to that is when there's money and time. But um, yeah, I think there's, there's many answers to that, that um, definitely resources affect our ability to be able to digitize materials and also considerations of um, what should be made available online and what can we make available online in an ethical way. So if someone in a diary, someone who is long deceased is talking about their very personal life and their crushes on fellow students and um, their deepest secrets, that feels a little bit easier to say, like, this was donated by the family, they're deceased, it will have no effect on living people's lives. But um, we have records that are much more recent that would have an impact. So 
we think about the ethics and we want to engage, especially with anyone whose records that we're leveraging in digitization. So we want to make sure we reached out to, I think like many, many hundreds of people asking for their permission to put the tapes from the scholar and feminists online. And we had wonderful responses. So it's when we can engage in both the um, effort of doing digitization as well as um, the ethical um, and legal sometimes um, requirements that we want to make things available. And I do recommend uh, heading over to the archives. One of the things that I thought about uh, when I became reunion chair is I really wanted to emphasize this, the continuity of the Barnard family, you know, going back all the way to the 1800s up through today. And we, we really stand on the shoulders of the women who came before us. Uh, and we also look ahead to the, you know, to the younger generation and the archives are the place where that all really comes together. Uh, and I, I hope that reunion is every year a place where all of that comes comes together as well. Um, and that's one of the reasons also why I wanted to, to give back to the archives, which has actually given me so much um, on a professional level and on a personal level, uh, a little bit of, of, of that sort of spirit. Yeah, I wonder, Rona, maybe you would be able to talk about your personal decision to donate your collection and what that process has been like for you. So I decided to um, to donate basically um, because I, I found so much joy in the archives and in learning about, uh, and so basically I've written about Barnard history since I was an undergrad. Um, I did my undergraduate thesis on it. I wrote a column in the Barnard Bulletin. Uh, thank you, Renana Rosenblum, if you're on, uh, who got me to write the column uh, called Fair Barnard all about Barnard history that had sort of been lost in the shuffle. And part of that was also because for a long time, Barnard didn't have an archivist. Um, when I was doing my undergraduate research, it was basically the librarians unlocked the archives door. It was down in the basement of Lehman, the old library. And we're kind of like, we have no idea what's here, just go. So I went <laughs> and really felt like I got to know these women from these early classes, the classes of 1905, 1911, 1909, and, and get an understanding of what it was like a little bit to be a student at that time. And so I wanted to fill the gap a little bit. And, and I, think we're, I think we're getting much better at it. And it's been amazing to have, um, you know, Martha is actually now the, the latest in a, in a line of professional archivists that we've had for the past uh, couple of decades, which has been amazing. And, but the, the 80s, for example, and the early 90s, I think are a particular lacuna in the collection, um, just because there was no one to activate that kind of, of uh, gathering. And so I wanted to be able to fill that gap. And, and I know it, it sounds a little uh, goofy and sentimental, but in some ways I, I like the idea of some Barnard student, you know, a hundred years from now, looking at my material in the same way that I looked at the material of these women, you know, from 1905. Um, and that's actually kind of how I also negotiated my own stuff. Um, you know, if I, when I was going back, should I donate this? Is this a good thing to put in the collection? It was kind of like, if I, if you found the 1905 equivalent of this, would you be excited and energized by it? And if the answer was yes, it was like, all right, then I'm going to throw it in and, and we'll see, uh, we'll see what's, what's what. So, you know, so I donated things like t-shirts, um, a lot of ephemera, I have a lot of paper stuff that's a little more complicated because as Martha was saying, you know, sometimes you write things or you have letters or, and that's a personal thing. And I would like to think I'm, you know, not going to, going to be around. So that's a, that's a consideration, but, you know, to document the, the daily life of a student was something that I felt I could do through t-shirts and play programs and, you know, handbooks for the resident, the residential halls, um, and even like the name tag on my, from my door from junior year, I think is in there, I, you know, and, and the message boards, because that's something that is now so different, I assume, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe students still do have those, but, um, 
but that's that was kind of the thinking behind it to, to offer the same chance do ask and Martha I wanted to ask because like all of my stuff is obviously written and I mean I've sent some images but what does it look like to collect a life in the digital age you know when people's photos are in the cloud and they're you know instead of letters they're sending emails or texts yeah thank you Rona this is something that I try to talk about with students when they come into uh, the archives for a session to learn about, you know, archival research, um, to ask them, you know, what would be in their archives? What is a record of their life? And just to remind them that archives are not just um, pieces of paper uh, written on typewriters or in incredibly difficult to read script, but that actually they're creating their own records and actually records are being created about them more and more in digital in digital um, life uh, all the time that you know you create social media text messages that have a huge amount of metadata um, and other information attached to them that we actually don't even ever see that just kind of like is embedded in the system or you know there's records of the things that you searched on google or the things that you bought online um, that are being created about you so i really think about the challenges in digital collecting both as a challenge just to actually um, collect the the items because they often require some amount of active intervention both for people to understand that these are vital and important records of um, historical, enduring historical importance, um, but also that, you know, they have to maintain, figure out a way to back up, do all these things that we might not be able to wait as we have until someone is retiring or, you know, making an end of life plan or something like that, or their family is finding their things to actually collect and that we have to be more active maintenance and education about personal digital archiving if we want there to be anything of someone's to collect. And I think also about in terms of preservation, um, there's also a lot of questions about just like how digital objects persist. So if you had a box of paper from the 1950s, it could sit on a shelf for 50 years and unless there was a major leak um, where you were storing it, you could take it off the shelf in 50 years, take the pieces of papers out and you would be able to access the information that's stored on them. But if you think about the kind of like increasing levels of difficulty in accessing information. So from um, photographs that are being taken on film that you can actually, you know, you can see, you might need some special equipment in order to access the negatives to um, a VHS tape or uh, another AV format that you need a specific piece of hardware in order to be able to access to a digital file which may be in a proprietary format, may be inaccessible unless you have a certain program in order to access it, um, that you need to then preserve both the software and um, the item. And a lot of people have done amazing work in preserving entire environments, especially for you know, artists and writers, um, where you wanna think about not just what they wrote in the Word document, but how were they um, editing? How were they working? What was their, um, their, their writing setup, their digital writing setup? So there are a lot of questions about both maintaining files so that they can be accessed and then emulating or or um, being able to access them in a way that resembles their original form in digital do we, have, do we have resources like that at Barnard? Like, do we still have microfilm machines? Do we still have, I don't know, an old Betamax somewhere? Yeah, in that, yeah we, in we do garage. have, a, yeah, we have a small collection of AV um, digitization equipment. So we have the capacity in-house to work with um, VHS, DV tapes and audio cassettes. 
everything else we essentially have to send out to either a friend who has um, equipment um, or a vendor to be able to transfer. So yeah, there's limitations there. And also, I mean, there's huge challenges with AV materials too, like the rate of deterioration is just so much faster for a VHS tape or a DVD even than right. a piece of paper. Right, and I will just actually give a shout out uh, to my sister who is the archivist, uh, Jocelyn Wolf across the street at Columbia. And I've actually given her some stuff too that the Barnard Archives didn't necessarily want because it was very Columbia centric. So for example, I had a, an audio tape of the 1991 Varsity Show. And so I handed that over to them and I think it's in the process <laughs> of being digitized or it was before everything went a little crazy. Yeah. So um, there's also, I, I will just say one more thing is that there's also different kinds of um, ethical questions that come into play when doing digital collecting. So we are collecting materials to document both COVID and um, starting very recently to document um, the justice for George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests that Barnard students and um, the broader Barnard community have engaged in. Um, and there's a student who works in the archives, uh, Tirza Anderson, who's class of 2021, who has um, started an amazing initiative to collect the records of SGA. Um, so thinking about how we do this digital collecting now, um, especially of activists um, and students who are, you know, working on um, organizing, thinking about what are the ethical standards and how do we protect um, identities of people who might be, um, might be, might be made more, more vulnerable by their records being accessible. So there's some really good guidelines and there's some wonderful people who have written about this and developed tools around those things, but that's just another kind of facet of digital collecting that I think about. So if, if people are uh, interested in, in, donating and, and we're not encouraging people to just go into their attic and take you know all of the stuff you've hoarded for years since graduation and, and throw it at the archives uh, but you know if, if people have material that they think would be useful to the record of life at Barnard um, the kinds of things that, that didn't get saved you know because either you know things like the president's office and the registrar right all that stuff gets officially collected it's, it's our lives, the students' lives, that in a way it's our responsibility to collect and to, you know, to share. So what uh, sort of guidelines would you give to, uh, to people who are thinking of now looking in the back of their closet? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Erna. I, I think some of the questions that I ask are, and talk about when people reach out are outlined in, in that brochure. They're also right. on our website. Kind of the, the um, emphases of our collecting. So, you know, we're interested in your unique records of your life at Barnard. We also do collect um, alum papers. So, um, especially for, you know, people who want to share a, a life lived in, in the work that you do, um, we collect those materials as well. And there's more that we do collect than we don't. I'll just say a quick note that we don't collect more than two copies of things. So we have many yearbooks and we appreciate all the offers, but we don't need any more yearbooks and um, we don't collect book collections. So those are just the, the no's. The yeses are gigantic. Um, we love to have, as you mentioned, like the things that wouldn't be captured in an administrative history of Barnard. So what your life was like, um, and we hold up especially wanting to collect the records of people who are um, underrepresented and, and marginalized at Barnard. So thinking about the histories that haven't been told about Barnard, um, the lives of black students and students of color, um, the lives of uh, queer um, and gender nonconforming and, and trans students, um, the lives of disabled students. And we're working on a project with the new um, Office of um, Center for Accessibility Resources and Disability um, Services or CARDS on documenting that, that long history at Barnard. Um, but especially wanting to hold up these records and um, kind of affirm that your histories are important. So if you have any questions, it's just a conversation. We talk about what you have and it can just be 
you know, open-ended as to what could be in your papers, what could be your records. And um, actually, someone has asked Martha, um, well, her college major was sociology, if I'm not mistaken, but how did you get into the archives field? How did I get into the archives field? I, uh, yeah, so I went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut, and in my senior year, kind of um, fell in love with the archives as a researcher in probably a very romanticized way, you know? Uh, I hear you. <laughs> one of those people opening a book and rhapsodizing about how wonderful it was and you know the smell and the feel of paper which is still you know very enticing to me too but I um, did a lot of archival research and after I graduated I did some work in digital archives um, at Democracy Now! and at the Franklin Furnace Archives which is a archives of performance art in Brooklyn just to see if I liked it enough to get a master's degree in it, which is the um, kind of uh, price of entry to be an archivist in, in many institutions is that you get a master's in library science or information science. So I did like it enough and I went down to uh, University of Texas in Austin to do my master's there. And it was just, yeah, I was especially interested in the moment that we're in, kind of this um, moment when it kind of there's an acceleration of new kinds of digital formats and we're still grappling in archives with even just paper collections too. Uh, so um, Renata Rosenblum asks, so what are the hot topics that today's researchers are interested in? And I, I know in some cases you may not be able to specifically say what a person's project is. Um, I can say that I just used it for um, the article I just had published in the Barnard Magazine on the Bermuda Shorts Affair. Uh, and that was an incredible mix of, you know, SGA uh, minutes and the president's office and letters that came into the president's office uh, and clubs and, you know, and, and kind of a, an interesting uh, array of, of material. Yeah, I mean, I think researcher interest varies very widely. Um, and it's always interesting in thinking about what we collect. It's almost like trying to project into the future about what will be important to researchers in the future because there has been like this immense broadening of what constitutes historical record in you know the last half century. Um, and I can see this getting broadened even further. So researchers, of course, are interested in you know the wonderful collections of very prominent people if they're doing research on those people. So Edizaki Chang's papers are very popular. Um, we also have a collection of records of an artist and activist and curator named Sabra Moore, who um, was in so many feminist art um, organizations in New York in like the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and was a part of the Heresies Collective that produced um, the Heresies magazine. And her records are very heavily used as well. Um, but yeah, students come in to research the history of their club, the history of an issue or a topic at Barnard. Some people just want photographs. That's often a lot of my work is working with, you know, communications um, to share images of the campus. Um, people are interested in all sorts of things. I think this past year, so many people were interested in the Greek games and the history of the Greek games, um, which, cool. it, you know, is amazing because they're very well documented and they, you know, um, it's a very interesting part of um, Barnard's history as well. Um, we also build, I mean, we've built a lot of collections related to, um, we have one of the most amazing zine libraries at Barnard. So um, a zine, if you're unfamiliar, is a self-published, um, small, usually small format um, uh, publication. So we have a collection of zines that circulates through the library and then also a set uh, usually a second copy in the in the archives, and then we've started to collect um, the the ephemera and the original materials of the people who make the zines. So the zinesters. So we're thinking that this kind of era of making and of um, some might call it like third wave feminism or this kind of um, push towards self publication in the 90s and 2000s. We think that will be of interest to researchers, and, and indeed many people come to use the zines too. I, I'm not, I, I have to confess, I'm not that, I, I know a little bit about the zine scene, um, that's a terrible rhyme, uh, but 
are, are they actually paper? Because one of the, the questions we have uh, from Joan is, uh, as archivists and historians, how do you see the future for those fields as technology eliminates written records and changes to technology, which we've talked a little bit about. Um, and I have to tell you, as a historian, I am uh, incredibly overwhelmed <laughs> by the idea of, of documenting anything recent. And even just from my own, you know, I'm president of my class, or here I am as the AABC reunion chair. Like, how do I document that? Even if it's just for my own, you know, knowledge, like, do I keep paper copies? Do I just keep it online? Do I keep every thread, right? And you have so many, and emails just build up so rapidly. Um, I don't know how, like, I don't know what the next Robert Caro is going to do, <laughs> document this particular moment, this incredible full moment in history, because, um, I guess I'm just glad that I stick to uh, the written era and <laughs> people were a little slower on the writing bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what this demands of us as archivists is really to decentralize the field. So we don't have um, maybe like administrators in every single office that are creating incredibly maintained uh, filing cabinets that have, you know, different categories organized by date. We don't have that kind of record anymore. So needing to distribute um, the skills and the strategies for digital archiving work, um, which I can also share uh, with you all. I have um, some uh, guidance for that that I share often with Barnard seniors as they're about to graduate and thinking about preserving, you know, their theses, the work that they've done at Barnard. But really it comes down to um, identifying what you have, um, identifying what you want to keep, um, making adequate preservation. So at least two copies in separate places, one in the cloud, one on a hard drive, one in the cloud, one on your computer, whatever it is. Um, and then like doing description so that you or someone else could feasibly um, understand what your records were. And of course, it's much easier said than done because we have such an explosion in all of the records that we're creating every day. Um, but I think it is important just that this kind of work um, spreads out and is not centralized, if it ever was, in, in, the, in the role of the archivist, but that it really becomes the work of all of us to determine what our histories are. There you go. And we have a one uh, sort of a technical question of, in regular, uh, Beth has asked, in regular non-pandemic times, do I need to make an appointment to visit the archives or just arrive during regular hours? In regular non-pandemic times, we prefer appointments, but would love to see you no matter whether you've made an appointment or not. So you're always welcome to come by the reading room during our open hours. Um, and we'll try to, you know, bring up materials. We're in a very unique situation that actually most of our archives are um, just five floors below where you use them, um, as opposed to offsite, which is uh, many, many archives, um, especially New York. Have that set up and um, if you make an appointment we can also talk with you about your research question and share some possible collections and you can look at descriptions of them and select the specific material that you want but unfortunately I think it might be quite some time before we can have drop-in researchers it might be a long time before we can have even scheduled researchers um, come to campus so um, I would definitely check in on our website and send an email um, because right now, you would not even be able to get onto campus um, if you came by without some specific um, specific appointment. So, yeah. And you know, and I do want to encourage people to to explore the the digital online uh, archives because they are it's such a resource. Um, and and I agree. I don't think that there's actually a substitute for paper per se. I I prefer to handle things and to be able to browse easily, but uh, when you can't access the stuff, you know, something is definitely better than nothing. And, and these are really great, uh, certainly a stopgap for these times, but just in general, it's a way to get a sense of, you know, what's out there and, and how Barnard students have written about themselves, um, you know, in the mortarboards, in the bulletin, uh, reported the news. 
Uh, and and I do encourage you to kind of you know just just play around with it and, and check it out. There are also online, I believe, Martha, online finding guides for collections. Yeah, our finding guides are all online, and so you can uh, dream about the archives that you will visit in the future. And um, yeah, as Rona said, you can use the digital collections, and you can always email archives at burner.edu if you have questions um, that maybe you're having trouble researching with the digital collections or that you might want some um, assistance with. So I just I just want to emphasize one more time and especially since I, I broke up uh, in the in the intro. The one thing I love about the archives or at least the materials that I've particularly used like the scrapbooks and the diaries and letters and and um, and that sort of thing is that it's, it's the stuff that, it's the lifeblood of the college. I mean, it's great to have the official record of who was appointed dean this year and who, and how did this building get built and how much did it cost? And, and all of that stuff is super important as an, uh, to chronicle the, in, the history of the institution. But the history of the college at its beating heart is its students. And so for the archives to have this record of what was it that students produced? What was it, you know, how did we entertain ourselves? How, what kind of events were happening on campus? I actually, one of the things in my collection is the packet of um, clubs from club day that I got, which just gives you, you know, there was a computer club, which was all very kind of early, you know, printer type Macintosh style stuff. And it, it's, those are the kinds of things that I hope that you've all come away to understand that that's history too. History isn't just the story of the big overarching, you know, events of the world, uh, as, as important as those are, but our stories, our lives are just as uh, are equal to those other sort of institutional histories. And what's great is if we can, the more we can collect, the, the more vibrant and the more vivid that picture becomes. Um, and so, you know, Martha asked me, like, why did you want to donate? And, and that in some ways is why I wanted to donate so that people have a record, have a picture of what it was like to be on campus in you know the late 80s and the early and the early 90s. So I hope this has inspired some of you to you know go go into the back of that closet mm -hmm. and uh, or into that attic and and maybe check out a few things and and see if you can contribute to the portrait that we're trying to create at the archives. Thank you, Rana. I couldn't have said that better myself. That was beautiful. <laughs> and oh. I'll just. Uh, Replug that tomorrow morning there will be a wonderful um, over the rainbow event with Kim Hall, Monica Miller, and Nia Ashley focused on um, the legacy of Ntsubaki Shange and the work that we've been doing um, to uplift that history. And that's at 11 a.m. That's at 11 a.m. Uh, that's a live event, so uh, you do need to register for it to get the link. So registration is open 24 hours. So do feel free to go back to the website and, uh, and enter your name in again. You can edit your registration uh, if, you, if you didn't sign up already for, for that amazing event. Um, and then we have uh, the moth, of course, in the afternoon. And that also is a great resource for us in the sense of, I mean, there's copyright stuff with the moth, but, it's, but the idea of people telling their stories is, is always a treasure for us, uh, for historians and for archivists and uh, for those of us who love Barnard and, and want those stories to be told. So, uh, so I hope that you will join us tomorrow for a, a sort of continuation uh, of, of these themes. Um, I wanna thank Martha for all of her time and effort in, in getting this program together. This is a program, as I said, that is very dear to my heart. The archives are probably my favorite place on campus. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I am so grateful to, to be a part of the, the sort of Barnard Archives family. Um, I've been very, very lucky to be embraced uh, by the archivists over the years. 
and uh, and we've been lucky to have them uh, guarding and collecting and overseeing our legacies. So um, my thanks to, to Martha, to Alumni Relations, and um, thank you to all of you for being here and joining us. And we hope we'll see you tomorrow at the last day of our reunion reimagined. So thank you. Have a great evening. <laughs>